Hello, my name is Dr. Ari Levine. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist in Israel, and I'm going to talk to you today about the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, which is a novel dietary therapy for the treatment of uncomplicated Crohn's disease. Uh, before I start, I'd like to mention that this talk is not intended to promote any specific product or to provide the data for self-treatment. Please consult your physician before starting any medical or dietary therapy. When developing a new therapy for any disease, we have to ask ourselves, what are the goals of therapy? And in Crohn's disease, there are well-defined goals. And this is a problem because most of the diets that have, are out there that are not validated diets for Crohn's disease uh, do not meet these goals or have not asked themselves, what are the goals before developing the diet? So what are the goals that are accepted by the medical community for treatment of Crohn's disease? Well, they should be divided into short-term and longer-term goals. In the short term for a patient with active disease, these would be clinical remission, which usually denotes absence of symptoms, a decrease in inflammation, and this is critical because symptomatic improvement is no longer sufficient for any treatment. And we need to achieve uh, or prove the ability to heal the intestines, and this is a longer term goal, usually not within the first three months. There are other short term goals that are important as well for patients with Crohn's disease that are not, often not addressed by medical therapies. We need to improve nutrition. It is important to do no harm, and we would like to prevent complications, uh, as would our patients. So all these are important medical goals uh, for people who are being treated with active Crohn's disease. So why should we be using dietary therapy in Crohn's disease? Well, first of all, because it works, and I'm gonna try to convince you how well it works uh, in this coming talk. It decreases inflammation, so it meets that very important goal that this is not a symptomatic treatment. This is actually a treatment for a disease. It has no side effects, literally zero side effects. And it's the only therapy that we have for Crohn's disease that has zero side effects. It improves nutrition. That's an added benefit. And it improves muscle mass. And by the end of this talk, I hope you'll find out that, that there are many other things that dietary treatment can accomplish that we weren't aware of maybe previously. When talking about dietary therapy, we have to acknowledge that there are a lot of problems with dietary therapy, primarily because of the poor quality of the studies that have been performed to date with diets. People can publish any diet that they like without having to prove all the different goals that are achieved, without having to have randomized controlled trials. These are all standards of care when developing medical therapies. And dietary therapy should meet the same standard as a medical therapy if we're gonna to decide to take a patient and treat him with that therapy. What are the problems that we've had so far? Well, small groups of patients, this continues to plague dietary research, groups that are publishing data on five patients, eight patients, 16 patients. There's selection bias, which includes primarily enrolling patients with very mild inflammation, mild disease. So, okay, maybe any diet would work for the very mild uh, spectrum of the disease, but we need to show that it's not just at the very mild spectrum of the disease, and that actually patients that are more inflamed can use this treatment as well. There are many of the studies that did not show any improvement in healing or reduction in inflammation, even though symptoms improved, yet they are still being touted as treatments for patients with Crohn's disease. And again, another sort of primordial sin is to combine Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and see the results when you combine these two. And there are some studies that clearly have shown more benefit in ulcerative colitis than in uh, Crohn's disease, but these are two different diseases. No other, no other diet except for the Crohn's disease exclusion diet and exclusive mental nutrition have undergone randomized controlled trials and shown benefit. And there's often no connection between the basis of the diet or the science that's been touted than the actual science of Crohn's disease and what we call the pathogenesis, what causes diseases. There's a huge disconnect because many of the things that people say are the reason that they're giving the diet and what it's supposed to do has actually been disproven and is not the cause or associated with, with this disease. We only have tier evidence, uh, tier one evidence, to induce remission for two diets. And one is exclusive enteral nutrition. This is considered the gold standard in Europe and Canada and the Commonwealth at the present time in children with mild to moderate disease that don't have complications. It's a short-term induction diet, as you can see on the left. It's very limiting because it requires drinking an exclusive formula for six to eight weeks without eating any other food. However, it is very effective. It reduces inflammation, it induces healing of intestines, and it improves nutrition. Nutrition. It meets most of the goals that I showed you in my first slide. 
The Crohn's disease exclusion diet is the first diet that was specifically developed for Crohn's disease that's also validated as both the science and the clinical effects. It is often coupled with partial internal nutrition, though we are doing studies that are not associated with uh, partial internal nutrition. At the present time, the data that have been published are for the short-term induction diet, but we have a maintenance diet as well that is undergoing trials. And contains varied solid foods with or without formula. Food variety improves every six weeks, so it's not a static diet. It's a dynamic diet that makes give people more choices as times go by. It reduces inflammation, it improves nutrition, and as I will show you, it's been shown to be superior to the gold standard I've shown you on the left, exclusive internutrition followed by partial internutrition, which is what is recommended by the European Crohn's Colitis Organization at the present time. So the problems that we've had with exclusive enteral nutrition and some of the other diets are they, they're static. It's the same diet forever. Fixed dietary restriction for life, there aren't many patients who will do that. And it's easy to understand why. However, the Crohn's disease exclusion diet is a progressive adaptal modular diet. It has, two, it has three phases. The first phase, it's uh, composed of two different phases, phase one and phase two, is the induction phase. This is supposed to put patients that are active into remission to change their microbiome, which is their gut flora, their gut bacteria. And then after a patient who's responsive and has done well by week 12 is then moved on to a third stage, which is the maintenance phase diet, which is much, much easier, brings back a lot of forbidden fru uh, foods with restrictions. There are free meals and desserts, et cetera. And beyond the first year, we have something that we haven't published yet, which is a lifestyle. And I won't be talking much about this, but this is a personalization of diet. So it's adapted to each person based on their foods that they like, but they're compatible with the principles of the diet. I should mention the Crohn's disease exclusion diet is the only diet to address the cause of the disease. And it's directed both at problems in the patients themselves, which is we call host problems or problems that have to do with the lining of the intestines and the immune system and the gut bacteria. So almost every other diet is either focused on one or the other, either on autoimmunity, which just means on the immune system, or only on the microbiome, but Crohn's disease is clearly a disease that involves aberrations in both segments, and therefore this diet is the only one that addresses everything. If I were to have to characterize the Crohn's disease exclusion diet in a snapshot, which isn't that easy, I would say it's a high protein, low fat, low additive diet. And I'm just gonna show you the first six weeks. This is the most restrictive phase. Remember, it gets better from week seven but it allows chicken breast, eggs, potatoes, rice, and rice products, lots of fruit, lots of vegetables, and olive and canola oil and fresh greens. But it does not allow animal fat, dairy fat, and vegetable oils, wheats, and grains. It's important to note there are many diets that have placed the blame on carbohydrates, but the evidence for that is very poor. In fact, fats seem to be one of the more important problems that are triggering inflammation in patients with Crohn's disease. It also reduces uh, red meat because heme in red meat and saturated fats in red meat have been linked to the disease by various mechanisms. We limit high taurine foods, which are present in meat and fish, and that's why fish is not allowed during the first stage except for once a week. And we limit insoluble fibers and vegetables and provide instead more soluble fibers because patients with Crohn's disease might have narrowing of their intestines or what we call stricturing disease. And you don't know that when you start treating a patient, but by week seven, there's a lot more latitude in giving more fruits and vegetables. And by week 10, all fruits and vegetables are allowed if there's no stricture present. And we severely limit many additives such as emulsifiers, carrageenans, thickeners, and sulfites. This is often not a simple task because you don't always know where the food is sourced and there are all sorts of tricks of the trade that our uh, industry can put different components and not label them because it's a secondary component that's added to the foods. But we've tried to trace this and, and make sure that we're uh, eliminating these things, especially in the first six weeks. So this is what the diet looks like when you cook it with the recipes that we provide. So I should say that the Crohn's disease exclusion diet is a program. It's a long-term program with accompanying recipes and the food can be quite tasty. And I've done the diet myself, so I know what types of foods that I like that can be eaten in the diet that limit your restriction. I'm gonna move on at the present time to the studies that we have and where we're going with these studies. And I'm gonna show you the first published study which was published last year in 2019 and it's called the CDED study. And that's what we call the diet, the CDED. We enrolled 80, 78 children and adolescents with active disease using objective criteria and assessment of inflammation before the diet. 
And we compared this, uh, the CDD, with a liquid formula called modulin to exclusive ventral attrition with modulin for six weeks. After six weeks, the Crohn's disease exclusion patients continue to the phase two diet, which is still part of the induction phase, but it's a step down diet. While the exclusive ventral nutrition patients transitioned to modulin with gradual return to free diet from week eight. And we used in any trial, this was the most rigorous trial as far as criteria for remission and reduction in inflammation. Even pharmaceutical trials have not used these rigorous criteria for remission and reduction in inflammation. And I'm going to show you very quickly a snapshot of the results so that you can get an idea for yourselves. On the right-hand panel here, you'll see the remission rate data using two criteria. On the left, this is what is usually used in most trials, which is a more lenient definition of remission. And we can see that the Crohn's disease exclusion diet here in red and exclusive ventral nutrition here in blue were very similar, between 75 to 80% remission. Excellent results with two dietary therapies to induce remission using this uh, uh, definition. But if we use the most rigorous criteria, we still had 75% remission. That's extraordinary. We just changed the diet of patients and 75% went to remission, not because of drugs, just by changing diet. And the difference that is seen here, uh, the declining effect is mostly due to compliance issues. So it's not that the exclusive intervention doesn't work, but when you give a very limiting type of diet, you're going to have more people who won't comply with the diet. Regarding tolerance here on the left-hand side, you can see that it was much better tolerated and 97.5% of the patients completed their 12 weeks of the diet uh, and only 2.5% stopped the diet because they were, it wasn't tolerated. But roughly 26% of patients in exclusive mental nutrition stopped the diet because it was, it was not tolerated. The response rates were very similar. So at this point, we can say that the, effects, the effect of this diet is very similar to the gold standard 75 to 80% remission using different criteria. That's extraordinary just by changing the diet. But by week 12, we saw a superiority for CDD over the gold standard exclusive ventral nutrition because children using CDD maintained that remission and it's shown that at week 12, still 70% were in complete remission versus only 45% of the patients who were on the modulin for the first six weeks and had gradually returned to free diet, even though the amount of calories was the same, the amount of protein was the same. So what this shows us is that when you start eating food, you're triggering the inflammation. And this is the first study to prove in a really rigorous trial that food is triggering inflammation and causing the disease. What was very astounding for us, and we didn't anticipate this is in the slide, is the decrease in inflammation as shown by calprotectin, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's a stool test that's very sensitive to inflammation. This study that uh, we started out in the CDD arm with an, a mean, which is sort of like an average, of 3,126. That's very high. The norm is 50. So these were very inflamed patients in this trial. It's not selection bias, very mild patients, very little inflammation. No, we had very inflamed patients going to this trial. And we can see it was very similar for the exclusive enteral nutrition group. What happened with CDD and coupled with modulin by week 12, there was a 75% decline in, within 12 weeks in calprotectin from 3,126 to 732. But what happened in the exclusive enteral nutrition group after they achieved remission, they had a similar magnitude of decline during the first six weeks they had a 50% increase once they started eating food. Again, proving that once you start eating food, your inflammation returns. So nothing else changed, no medications, it's just starting to eat food. Again, proving that return to free diet is causing inflammation, showing that port the importance of diet in causing this disease and triggering inflammation. So what were the clinical conclusions of the CDD trial? Well, there were multiple conclusions beyond our expectations. The first is that CDD induces remission and between 75 and 80%, depending on how we define remission, very good. It induced sustained remission by week 12 and 75% of patients, excellent. And it was equal or superior in every measure compared to the gold standard exclusive enteral nutrition that we measured. There wasn't a single factor that was better with exclusive enteral nutrition over CDD, but the converse was true. There were multiple factors that were superior with CDD. And because the patients in the CDD group did not relapse, did not have an increase in calprotectin, but continued to have a decline, what this proves is that the foods that are limited in CDD are the foods that are triggering uh, the inflammation, 
which means that we identified the right foods. And this is the first diet that we can actually say we know what we're eliminating and we know that these foods are the ones that are probably linked to the disease. But there are other conclusions as well. Um, so just as a snapshot, it's easy to remember 75% because we had 75% sustained remission, a 75% reduction in calprotectin, and 75% of patients had remission with normal CRP in those who had elevated CRP. Very good results in inflammation. We found that specific foods in regular diet drive inflammations, but the foods in the CDD uh, diet did not. We found that it corrected the imbalance in bacteria, which we think may be causing the disease. So the perceived bac bacteria that we think are the bad guys in, in Crohn's disease, and we call them pathobionts, went down with the Crohn's disease exclusion diet. And this was actually a planned outcome. This was, the diet was structured to do that. And we also had an increase in the good bacteria such that by week 12, most of the bad bacteria were down to levels of normal healthy controls and only one bacteria called E. coli was still elevated. And we found that Crohn's disease exclusion diet improved leaky gut. So this is the first diet to actually improve leaky gut syndrome. And 50% of patients who had abnormal uh, leaky gut normalized their uh, leaky gut within the first three weeks of the diet, whereas modulin had no effect whatsoever. So the diet itself is improving the uh, leakiness of the gut. And all this comes back to the theory that I've been proposing for many years, which I think is the best theory for Crohn's disease, and it's called the bacterial penetration cycle. And I think that many people believe this is the best theory for Crohn's disease at the present time. What does this theory state? It states that the common denominator for people who develop Crohn's disease is the presence of mucosal or penetrating bacteria. What does that mean? It means that there are bacteria that have reached the lining of the intestine and are stuck there, and the body cannot clear those bacteria. They're unwanted neighbors. So usually bacteria cannot cling to the lining of the intestine. There are many uh, uh, mechanisms that will prevent that from occurring in normal individuals, but this does not occur in patients in Crohn's disease. But if that state happens, you're gonna get stimulation of the immune system and you're gonna get inflammation. So this is not autoimmunity at all. This is simply the immune system doing what it's supposed to do, trying to get rid of these bacteria that are stuck to the intestinal lining and actually penetrating that lining and causing the inflammation. And this will cause a vicious cycle because the more this barrier is damaged by these bacteria, the more inflammation we'll have, which will allow more bacteria to adhere and we get a vicious cycle, which will be uh, uh, exacerbated every day, every meal by the different foods we eat, as I've shown you before. So let's assume that a patient is dietary responsive. This is a new term. What does that mean? If we take a patient and we give them the Crohn's disease exclusion diet with partial nutrition for six weeks and they go into remission or they have a really good response, I would call that a dietary responsive patient. In that patient, diet is driving disease. This would open the possibility of three new strategies that did not exist before for the treatment of patients with Crohn's disease. One, in the appropriate patient who's highly motivated might be dietary monotherapy without drugs at all. So you can start with the diet and they respond and then go on to the maintenance diet. And if the patient heals over and does well on the diet and doesn't require drugs, there's no reason to start drugs. We have patients like that at the present time. The second strategy, which is the more common strategy, was to, we need to combine at this point the drug and diet. And once a patient has completely healed over the intestines, if that occurs, to consider maybe de-escalating or stopping drug and just staying on diet. And again, this will require a motivated patient who's willing to stay on diet alone. And the third would be to start medical therapy because there are complications, because it's more severe disease. But if at any point the patient falters or fails to respond to therapy, then to go on to use the diet as a rescue therapy. And we're using that as a very successful strategy. We've actually published our experience in 21 patients who failed all their biological uh, therapies. These were adults and children. And 62% went into complete remission just by changing the diet after failing all their drugs. So I'm gonna summarize now and tell you the reasons I believe physicians and patients should be using the Crohn's disease exclusion diet if they're appropriate for diet. It's well tolerated, as we've mentioned before. It decreases inflammation. There's no side effects. It improves nutrition and it'll improve muscle mass. But the new things that I will add to this slide is that it decreases the bad bacteria, it improves the good bacteria, which has not been shown for other dietary therapies, and it treats the cause of the disease 
as we've seen before, if diet's driving the disease, we should have a strategy to control this. And all this would lead me to uh, state that this should be an, an important treatment that should be used more frequently in patients. But the most important reason that you would want to use it is because it works. And of course, this will not work in any patient who does not have the discipline uh, to stay on a diet or whose lifestyle would not be appropriate. Thank you very much.